My title for today is Simple. We are, we're in the simple series still, but it's simple, the identity of Jesus. And we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 7. And um, now, if, if you haven't been here, this whole concept of simple is, is not just like simple to where it's not complex. It's, it's simple to where it's true or it's pure. And we're looking at what simple followers of Jesus look like. What are some characteristics of some some simple followers of Jesus. Now, I'm going to warn you, okay? I, I, I want to give you this warning because I, I, I want to just make sure that, that we're all on the same page here. I'm going to come out of the gate today swinging, okay? Are, are, we, are, we, are we cool with that? Everybody all right with that? Okay, but I'll make you a promise. I'm going to come out of the gate swinging. I may give you a black eye in the beginning, okay? But I promise I'll give you an ice pack, and that'll make sense here in a few minutes, okay? Um, but here it is. Normally, I start off with a question because I want to get our minds thinking in that direction. And, you know, what is this thought that we're going to build all this on? So here's the question for today. What would you say is the most important thing about yourself? Think about it for a second. What is the most important thing about yourself? Is it your family? Because your family is pretty important, right? I mean, my family is very, very important in my life. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's how you contribute to this world. You know, you're, you're thinking kind of selfless. Maybe, maybe you would say, no, 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 my faith is, is the most important thing about me. But I want to take this a little bit further and a little bit deeper. The most important thing about you is what you think of Jesus. That is the absolute most important thing about you. The identity of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And you may, it's okay to push back at me a little bit in this. It's okay. But hopefully today I will be able to show all of us how important the identity of Christ is. Um, th there's, there's been a lot of accusations at what Jesus is throughout time. Um, now, I will say, I, I wanted to make this point. You cannot historically deny that there was a Jesus. Like, even, even the biggest critics cannot deny that there was this Jewish man named Jesus. He came and he lived somewhere around 0 to 33 or so AD, okay? You can't dispute that. You really can't even dispute the fact that there was this guy, Jesus, and he hung on a cross and he died, okay? It's a historical fact. There's more historical evidence and archaeological evidence of that than there is for many, many other figures that you would say, of course I believe that person. There is even historical writings, not in the Bible, but historical writings that talk about Jesus's resurrection. There was one person, I believe it was a Roman historian writing, and, and he says something to the effect of, as for this Jesus, we don't even know what to do with him. Like, like basically, we would say it is he's in another category. What does he mean by that? He means there was this Jewish guy, Jesus, and he was crucified. He was put in a grave, and then people saw him afterwards. He's going, we, we don't know what to do with that. So there's historical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. And so, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, Jesus was, he, he was a good teacher, Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Jesus was a really good teacher. I like the stuff that he said. It was really good. I try to live by a lot of that. Um, Nikki and I were in San Diego one year for the National Youth Workers Conference, and we were riding on the public transportation. It was like a metro rail kind of thing. And I, I look over, and there's this guy reading a book, and, and um, I think he was reading it backwards, and it was in a different language, and, and it looked kind of like a Bible. I'm assuming it was the Quran. And so... Um, here I go, and, and, and you, know, you know me, I start up a conversation with this guy, and I'm talking to him, and Nikki's going, oh, great, here we go, right? And I go, hey, if you don't mind me asking, who was Jesus to you? And, and he just flat out said, he said, oh, man, I like Jesus. Jesus was a really good teacher, and I'm like, oh, wrong answer. 
And wouldn't you know, right then we arrived at our stop and the doors opened, right? And, G- and, and, and Nikki is like, thank you, there is a God in heaven, right? Because she had no idea what was coming. But the guy said, yeah, he, he's a good teacher, man. I like his stuff. Or a lot of the times people will say, man, he was, he was a prophet. He, was, he wasn't like the prophet, but he, he, was a, he was a really good prophet, you know? Um, some people, if you don't really subscribe to those things, you would say he was a lunatic. Because let's face it, anybody that would claim to be God and then die for his cause and not really be God, that was a lunatic. And there was a lot of those guys around that time. And even throughout history, people that claimed to be God and they died for their cause and, well, they just died, right? That would be described as a lunatic. Maybe you see Jesus as, you, you would say like, Jesus is very important to me. J- Jesus, Jesus is so important to me. Or you would even, you take a little further and you say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the son of God, like he is one third of the Godhead, part of the Trinity. Like, like yes, absolutely, he's the son of God. And, and, and it's getting better, but we're not quite there yet. Maybe you would even say, Jesus is my savior. Jesus is absolutely the savior of my life. And all three of those things, you you would be absolutely correct to say those things. But while all of those things are good and true and they ought to be in your life, we we should, when faced with, hey, what what is Christ to you? Like, what's the most important? When you think of Jesus, what do you think? We ought to say things like, Jesus is the driving force in my life. Like, like, like Jesus is the filter in which I make all decisions. Every decision that I make, I filter them through, you know, WWJD, that whole, you know, what would Jesus do thing? Like, like that's, that's really it. Like, like I, I, I just want to know what Jesus would do because I want to model my life like Jesus. Or maybe you would say, Jesus is the only reason I have undeserved forgiveness from the sin in my life. Or maybe you would just sum up and say, Jesus is absolutely the reason that I live. And at this point this morning, you're probably going, I mean, that's what I meant, right? I mean, I'm, I, yeah, 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 th- those things, what you just said, that's how I feel about Jesus. And see, we, we, we would probably, beca- and because we're in church, and of course you're going to say this, it's the churchy answer, we would probably subscribe to saying those things. But see, what I want from us and what I want for myself in church, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not even there yet. But when somebody says, who is Jesus to you? I, I want us to default to those things. I-, I want us to say, man, Jesus is everything to me. I mean, yes, he's my Lord, he's my Savior, but like, like I wake up in the mornings and everything is about Jesus. So here's a couple of questions. I want to maybe flip this around a little bit and maybe answer a question that you've been wondering. Can you be a true or simple follower of Jesus and not always live like that? Is it possible? Let me ask it a different way. What happens if you have periods in your life that you don't feel that way? What happens if there are times in your life where, okay, yeah, Jesus has been everything to you, but he's not really there right now. He's not really on that pedestal, on that throne that he ought to be in your life. What happens? Or is, it, is that okay I mean, obviously, we know that's not what it's supposed to be, but, like, can you still be a Christian? Like, how does God see that? Is God mad at you during those times? Is that okay to have periods in your life where you maybe doubt a little bit? Um, I love this picture. Go ahead and put that picture up there. This is, we talk about this place a lot. This is Caesarea Philippi. This is in the north of Israel. And I've showed pictures like this a lot. See where those people are back there? That's a cave. 
Now, originally, it's not there now, but there was a spring. The spring that you see right there, that's one of the three main springs that comes out and feeds the Jordan River and creates the Jordan River. Okay, originally, before there was some earthquakes, that spring came up out of that cave where those people are. It, it was magnificent. This city of Caesarea Philippi was phenomenal. It, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's now all ruins and protected and everything. But we've talked about this place a lot. This was an awful pagan place, and they would take people up to the top of that cliff right there and make human sacrifices and throw them down into the spring, and there's rocks right there, and they would be dashed upon the rocks and just churned in the spring, and just awful, awful things would happen. Just to the right, you can see the one smaller opening and then another one all the way on the edge of the screen there. There were temples there temples to different gods that they would have. I've mentioned this before. One of them was the temple of the dancing goats. We're in church right now. We're gonna, not going to talk about what happened there, but let me just tell you, it was absolutely despicable, disgusting, awful things in the name of worshiping gods, little g gods. Okay, I'm being very graphic to explain to you what was happening in this place. And in fact, the reason why they would make sacrifices right there into their spring is because they believed like that was the entrance to the underworld. That was an entrance into Hades. They really believed that. I was reading an article last week um, about this called The Gates of Hell by Ray Vanderlaan, and he says this. He says, it was a city of people eagerly knocking on the doors of hell. Sounds like a wonderful place you'd want to go hang out in, huh? It was awful. It was beautiful, but it was awful. Now, with that as the backdrop, I want to read to you a story that most of you guys know of something that happened there. So Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, it says this. So Jesus is walking along with his disciples. Again, this is in northern Israel, and he says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? There's that question. What's the talk? What, what are people saying about me? And Jesus was becoming more and more popular. People were talking. They were, is this guy, he's doing miracles? I mean, you know, okay, different prophets did miracles, but man, this guy, it seemed different, like, like he was teaching differently. Maybe this is the Messiah. What, what's, what's going on? Could this really be it? And so there was all this talk. And so Jesus throws out the question, who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus, just right on the nose, asked them the very same question I asked you this morning. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Jesus just holds no punches, throws it right out there. Okay, that's great. I asked what other people say, and now I'm asking you. My disciples, those of you who have walked with me for a couple of years now, you've seen me do these miracles. You've seen my teaching. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, I love Peter. Peter's probably my favorite Bible character um, because pre-resurrection Peter was a dingbat, Okay, pre-resurrection Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth, was always just doing things without thinking, right? Let's pull out a sword and cut off a servant's ear. That's really going to help Jesus. I mean, you know, and always saying these stupid things. And at one time, Jesus even called him Satan because he just said the most incorrect, dumb thing. And so, but, but post-resurrection Peter, oh man, he was awesome. He was a force to be reckoned with. So, so pre-resurrection Peter, he actually got something right one time. So he says this, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, or your translation may say the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter nails it. He, he, he wasn't just saying, yep, you're Jesus. He was saying, no, 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 you are the son of God who was sent to redeem us. You are the Messiah. You are the one that's been foretold it's for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, hundreds of different times. You are him. You are everything, and we will follow you. 
That is what Peter was saying. Verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now, something, Jesus does something really cool here, as he normally does. He changes Simon's name to Peter. Now, Peter in the Greek means pebble or small stone. Okay, so he's like, you're, you're a rock. You're not really a big rock, but you're a small rock. Okay, but that, that's good, that's strong. So he says, okay, so now I'm changing your name. You're, you're pebble, okay? You're small rock. And then he says, but upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, many people, a lot of times in the Catholic religion, they believe that Jesus was saying, upon you, Peter, I'm going to build my church because Peter's a rock. I do not believe that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, upon this foundational truth that I am the Messiah, which would be the identity of Christ, right? The thing that we are saying is the most important thing in your life. Upon this foundational truth that I have come to redeem and save the world, upon this truth, I'm going to build my church. And I don't know, I wasn't there, okay? But as I picture this story happening, I would like to believe that Jesus was standing there, and you can't see it the words, but that, that big cave where they made the sacrifices, I, I just picture Jesus just looking at it and going, upon this truth, that I'm the Messiah, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell. He uses, now obviously that was just a spring and it was a cave, it was not the entrance into Hades, okay? But Jesus is kind of doing this play on going, the gates of hell aren't even going to be able to stand on this truth that I am the Messiah that I am who I say I am. That brings us to our first of three points. Simple followers of Jesus prioritize the identity of Christ. The identity of Christ must be everything in your life, and here's why. Because if you downgrade or downplay Jesus in your life, in, in, in a way, it, it allows us to prioritize and upgrade ourselves. But see, when we see Jesus as who he really is, like he's up here and where are we? We're not even like here, okay? But oftentimes we're kind of, yeah, Jesus is here, but I'm here, I'm pretty special, right? I mean, we're, we're not even on the map anymore when we see Jesus for who he really is, who he should be seen as, how important he ought to be in our lives, how he ought to be the driving force in our lives. When we see him that way, it changes everything. So in case I wasn't clear yet, hopefully I have been, but in case I wasn't clear yet, what is the identity of Christ? Okay, what, what, what exactly? What, I just want to make sure, okay, God in the flesh. Here's just a few that I came up with. He's God in the flesh, okay? He's not... He was a great teacher, but he's not just a good teacher. He's not just a prophet, okay? He definitely wasn't a lunatic, okay? He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, okay? God in the flesh, creator and sustainer of everything. He didn't just get it started and then said, I hope it works out for you. He got it started and he keeps it going. He has the whole world in his hands, that song that we used to sing as kids, okay? He chose, not he was forced to, not, oh, he had to. He chose to die a miserable death on the cross, shed his blood, and endured the shame of all sin, past, present, and future, to make a way for you to spend eternity with him and avoid eternal punishment. That's who my Jesus is. He chose that for me. And guess what? I'll share it with you. He chose it for you too. And if nobody else on this world, if it was just you, he would have done the exact same thing for you. That's how much he loves you. And the last one here, what's the identity of Christ? He's the God who knows you. Now watch this. this, this I wrote this. 
I've read this numerous times studying for this message, and it still blows me away. He is the God who knows you and desires intimate relationship with you, one in almost 8 billion people on this earth, not counting everybody that came before you. He knows you and wants an intimate relationship with you. That's the identity of Christ. That's how we ought to see Jesus when we think about him. Because again, if you see him like that, and not just as your fire insurance, it's a game changer. It changes everything in your life. And if you're, again, let's flip this upside down. If you're not seeing or prioritizing Jesus for who he actually is, it's easy to live a you-centered life. It's easy to let Jesus be second fiddle. It's easy to be a lukewarm Christian, if that's really even such a thing. Revelation 3 has something to say about that. It's easy to let, here's, here's this one, here's the biggest lie ever. It's easy to let good person theology drive you. Like, you know, that, that thought or that belief that you can good enough your way into heaven. I believe that is the biggest lie ever told. And that is keeping more people out of eternity with Jesus than anything else. So it's easy to let good person theology drive you. And if you're not prioritizing who Jesus actually is, it's easy to make decisions based on your wants and your desires, the things that are important to you before we actually consult, again, the creator and sustainer of all the world who desires intimate relationship with you. And I say this all the time, but I love this expression. If you are prioritizing who Jesus really is, then you wake up in the morning and you say, yes, Jesus, okay, now tell me the question. Because your answer is always going to be, yes, I will follow you no matter what to the ends of the earth, Lord. I will follow you because you're worth it. That's what our answer ought to be. (laughs) Two weeks ago, as we said, Jake preached, and Jake did a great job. Um, We could basically insert his message right here. If you remember, he asked, how do we stay motivated to advance the kingdom? He gave us three things. He says, daily keep your fire stoked. Read and be emboldened by the word of God and practice love. Be like Jesus. When you see Jesus for who he actually is, we will do those. We'll, we'll, we'll have a desire to do those things. So simple followers of Jesus prioritize the identity of Christ. I love the quote by Andy Stanley. When you see as God sees, you'll do as God says. I love that. Okay, Question. Who felt better before you got here this morning? Anybody else? Because I did. Because this is, I mean, this is cutting me deep. And I'm like the pastor, okay? Because it's easy to drift away from what's truly important to what we think is really important in life. All right, so Bibles, Luke chapter 7. Now we'll get to our real story and we'll finish this up here. This is quick. So as you're turning to Luke chapter 7, I want to set the stage of what's happening here. Jesus' popularity is is blowing up. Like we said earlier, people are talking about him. They're hearing about all of these miracles that he's doing. They're asking, okay, this actually might be the Messiah, this, this might be the guy. Let's go see him. A, a, a lot of them were about him. A lot of them were just looking for a free meal or they were just looking to be healed and they got much more than that. So like everybody's talking about Jesus. The word around Israel and all the regions around was this guy, Jesus, might be the real thing. He might be the Messiah. So in Luke chapter seven, a couple things, a couple stories happen that we know about. Number one, Jesus heals the centurion servant. Remember, Jesus says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Uh, And then Jesus brings the widow's son back to life right before this. So all these miracles are happening. 
And then it doesn't say it in Luke 7 here, but we know at this time John the Baptist is in prison. All right, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, all right? John the Baptist, who's, who's the forerunner of Jesus, the prophet who was put there so that he could say, hey, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's Jesus. That's the Messiah. That's the guy that you ought to follow. That John the Baptist was in prison, and it didn't look good. Like when you're in prison like that, it usually doesn't end up well. So that's happening right here in the middle of Luke chapter 7. And in verse 17, it says this. This news about Jesus, and that's Jesus, all of these miracles and and him gaining notoriety and all that. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples, that's John the Baptist, John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? What in the world just happened there? Like, isn't John the Baptist like John the Baptist? I mean, like he's a brand of his own. How is it that the forerunner that was chosen before he was even born to point out Jesus is doubting that Jesus is the Messiah? How is that happening? Because he's sitting rotting in a jail cell. And when we are in that valley, thoughts start to creep in, don't they? And what happens to our faith when things start happening in our lives? Our faith often starts to wane and we start to doubt. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, it says, For he, this is talking about John the Baptist, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Church, that's not normal. Like, this is John the Baptist. Later on in Luke 7, verse 28, uh, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. So again, how could John the Baptist be doubting who Jesus is. Number two, simple followers of Jesus are not expected to be perfect. There's the ice pack. Maybe that's what you needed to hear this morning. Because I know when I'm up here preaching, I mean, I say we've got to do this and we've got to do that and there's a lot of you got to do's. But I need you to know, church, we are not expected to be perfect. Because guess what? Newsflash, I hate to be the person to break it to you, but you're not perfect. You're not going to be perfect, and neither am I. So this, this ought to relieve a lot of pressure off of us. Now, I want you to hear me, and I want to be very, very, very clear. This is not permission to act however you want to to get away with whatever you want to as long as you have Jesus as your fire insurance or as, you know, you do church on Sunday, but, you know, you heaven on Sunday and you live like the other place during the week. And, you know, all, that's not permission to do that. This is permission, however, to give yourself a break, maybe from some of the guilt and the shame that you have been carrying around for years. Because I may or may not know you, but I know me, and I know I've done a lot of ridiculous, stupid things in the past that I am just guilty of. And I know we know God's forgiveness is absolute, and, and, uh, but, but we're still holding on to this guilt. I want to tell you right now, church, God's not holding on to that sin. Why are you? If you have asked for forgiveness for that sin, it has been released. You are the one who was not releasing it. And I want to tell you this morning, you can let it go. You are not expected to be perfect. Are we expected to strive after sanctification, which I, that's one of those big churchy words that I love. It's that process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. 
Are, are, are we supposed to strive to be like Jesus? Again, newsflash, you're never going to arrive there, but that's the goal. Yes, we are expected to try to live like that. But God is a God of complete forgiveness, grace, mercy, and love. And he does not expect perfection because he knows it's impossible. So simple followers of Jesus are not expected to be perfect. Verse 20, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, that's really important to hear, at that very time, when they arrived, as they were watching Jesus, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. What do we usually call that? Somebody who's called into court of somebody that has seen and heard some, something? What do, we, what do you call them? A witness. Jesus is saying, you have witnessed what's going on. You've seen it for your own eyes, which basically that ought to be good enough. Jesus ought to be able to say, hey, I want you to go back and tell John what you've seen. And that probably would be enough, but not for Jesus. Jesus does something so cool here. Watch this. He says, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And again, as if seeing Jesus do these miracles wasn't enough, Jesus does this really cool play on thing for John. Here's a little Bible trivia. Does anybody know John the Baptist's favorite prophet? Just shout it out if you know it. He quotes a lot from the book of Isaiah, okay? Obviously, they didn't quote from the New Testament because why? There was no New Testament. That was a trick question. Okay, so he, they all, all these prophets, they quote from the Old Testament, but John loved Isaiah. He loved to quote Isaiah. And again, this is one of those things where if you're reading quickly, you would miss it. But Jesus does this thing so cool. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3, Isaiah is prophesying, he's prophesying more about Jesus' second coming, his, his return. But listen to the words that he says. He says, strengthen the feeble hands. Now, again, as we're hearing these words, again, this is second coming, Jesus. But think about what these words would have meant to John as he is sitting in a jail cell probably knowing what's going to happen. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. So again, second coming, that's the divine retribution and all of that. And, but those would have been encouraging words to John, but now listen to what it says here. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Sound familiar? Jesus makes a reference back to John's favorite prophet, Isaiah. Here's what he was doing. He was saying, hey, your disciples saw me doing these things, and because you know I can do these things at this coming, you know it's me and I will be coming again. What a powerful testimony. John the Baptist would have immediately heard them say this and known absolutely this was Jesus, this was the Messiah. He was reminding him, hey, I can do these miracles now and I'm gonna do them again someday and when I come back for divine retribution and vengeance. John would have known, okay, I doubted this is Jesus, this is the Messiah. So back to Luke 7, verse 22. 
He said, so we replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Pause for a second. And then Jesus says one more line, and that's going to be our last verse in this passage. And he says something so strange that, that, that we hear it and we go, wait a minute, Jesus, what, what does that mean? What are you talking about? And so Jesus would have said, you know, the blind receive sight, the, 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 the deaf will hear. And he says all that, and he pauses for a second. And, and it's almost like he stops talking to them. And he starts talking to the crowd, and he says this one line. He says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble or is not offended on account of me. What? What in the world does that mean? You will be blessed if you don't stumble because of Jesus? What in the world does that mean? Let me answer your question with the question. Have you ever been absolutely convinced that God should do something a certain way? Like, 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 you've got it all figured out for God, okay? Don't leave me hanging out here by myself, because you know you have, okay? Like, you have prayed for something, and you have basically laid it out to God on a silver platter exactly how it should work out. Like, okay, God, here's my needs, and here would be the way that, that we could fix it, and da-da-da-da-da. Anybody, has any, just, would you be honest with me and say you've done that before? Okay, thank you. And then he didn't, right? And then he didn't answer you that way? And, and then what's the next thing that we say? God, don't you understand? Which in the history of stupid questions, that's probably right up there. God, don't you understand what I'm going through? Don't you understand, God, what my needs are? Don't you, don't you know what's happening to me? Don't you know how much this hurts? Number three, simple followers of Jesus trust that God knows best. When Jesus said, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me, what he was saying is, hey, you will be blessed if you understand that I'm not going to do things how you want me to do them all the time. Sometimes I'm going to step in and do it exactly like that, and hey, great, you, you got one. But guess what, church? And you probably know this already. God doesn't always operate like that. God uh, usually has a bigger and better plan for us. And I, I hate to say it, but sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers like we want. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers at all in the area that we want. Maybe sometimes he's, he blesses us and he does things differently, but sometimes God just says flat out no. No, I, I won't deliver you out of that right now. No, I won't heal you or heal them. No, I, 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 I'm not going to do that. And Jesus is saying, you will be blessed if you trust God no matter what. If you understand that God knows so much more and so much better, you will be blessed. I love Job, the story of Job. And this guy, he lost everything, like everything. And he's sitting there and he's in pain and he lost all his riches, his family, all of that. And he says, Though he slay me, though God is just doing whatever he wants to do, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I'm going to trust him no matter what. No matter what happens to me, God, I've subscribed to this thing where you own me. Like, like I am yours. You are my savior, but I am yours. So if I'm truly going to say I am yours, that means, God, you've got all of me. However you decide, you have all of me. That's what God's calling us to. You will be blessed if you trust Jesus no matter what, even if it doesn't make sense. See, that's the thing. Oftentimes, it, it, God, this doesn't make sense. There's such an easier way, God. And he would say, I know, I know, 
but there's a better way, and I know. So I want to leave you with this. It's a cute little rhymy line that it took me all of about five minutes to write, but it's a great truth. Seeing Jesus as sovereign king removes the doubt this life will bring. It's pretty easy to remember, right? When you see Jesus as the sovereign king, you know what that word sovereign means? In charge, top dog, he gets to decide. We don't, we don't, we don't, I mean, we can pray, we can throw our two cents in, but at the end of the day, guess what? He's sovereign king. He gets to do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, as long as it's within his nature. Sovereign king. Seeing Jesus as sovereign king removes the doubt this life will bring. Again, probably not a newsflash to you, but this life is going to bring some doubt, right? This life is going to throw you some things that we just don't know how to get through. And you, you just, I, I'm not going to make it to tomorrow. And then guess what? Tomorrow comes. Okay, well, I made it through yesterday. I'm definitely not going to make it through tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes. And when we trust God more and more and more, and we say, okay, you know what, God? You are in control. I can trust you with everything that I have. <laughs> At the end of the day, he's a sovereign king that came, and we said earlier, gave his life for us. You think he doesn't have your best interest in mind? He didn't forget about you. He's not holding that guilt against you. He wants intimate relationship with you. And when you see him as the sovereign king, it's going to remove the doubt. When you hit those valleys, when you hit those lows, when you hit those, those things that I don't know if I'm going to get through this, we see Jesus and the identity of Jesus as the correct way, the most important thing in our lives. It changes everything. So three things. Simple followers of Jesus prioritize the identity of Christ. Simple followers of Jesus are not expected to be perfect. It's probably my favorite one. And number three, simple followers of Jesus trust that God knows best. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you that you are good. We sang it earlier, over and over. What, what, a, what great songs to sing for today, that you are good. You're never going to let me down. Thank you for that promise, Lord. God, there are so many times in this life where it does not look like we're going to make it. We just can't take it anymore. And sometimes, God, you are just allowing us to go through that so that we will fall on our knees and crawl to you. Thank you, God, that you are a savior, that you love us, that you desire intimate relationship with us, that you want us to call upon your name to be saved. God, I know there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who don't have that relationship with you. Right now, God, in this moment, would you just impress upon their hearts that they need you? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, you do not have a relationship with Jesus Right now in this moment, would you just cry out to him and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you to be my savior. Help me to trust you. Help me to see you for who you really are. Save me. Change me. I give you my life, Lord. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make any commotion, but I'd love to just be able to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today I got it right for the first time. I decided to start a relationship with Jesus today. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, today's the day. Thank you, Lord, that you are a savior. God, thank you that you are so good. You are so good. Help us to trust you no matter what and help us to see you for who you 
really are. God, we pray for this time of offering. Use it, God. Be honored by it. Help us to see it as a a form of worship where we have the opportunity to give back to you, Lord, of what you have given to us already. Help us as a church, God, to be so generous, to bless this community, to be able to do things like Island KX and just to give away scholarships, but just to do things that point people to you. That's what we want to be about, Lord. We just want to be a church that points people to you. Thank you, God, for this amazing time this morning. Convict our hearts, Lord. Help us to grow closer to you. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. And it is in your most holy name that we pray. Amen.